This sermon is titled Leadership The Four C's of Leadership Part 4 Be enriched as you listen All right We're going to get into God's word today is um are we going to finish our sermon series on leadership uh the four C's of leadership so today we are going to be talking about the final C uh in in this I just want a quick uh you know last Sunday uh something very interesting happened after the service a 12 year old boy came and he said um, uh, i was very scared to share this testimony so i didn't share it i want to come and tell you now so he came here he said I, I, i this is exactly this is what he said so i don't know all the details other than what he shared with me he said he had fallen he, 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 there was pain on his right side but during the prayer time he felt sweetness in his mouth like honey coming in his mouth and he said i promise i didn't eat anything <laughs> so that sweetness was just coming in his mouth and then at that moment all his pain left so he came and he stood here and he said you know everything is gone now this is a 12 year old we can believe it or not but i trust what he said and i'm sure you know this was a special uh you know encounter that he had uh, with the, with god just doing something very special for him and thank god for that. Amen. All right, so we've been spending some time talking about leadership and trying to understand uh what is good leadership? What what were the marks of a good leader and you know, how how do we provide good leadership? And I I I just want to say this and make it very clear that I'm not personally I'm not say, sharing this with you uh because i have attained some level of leadership or something no we are all learning together and growing together amen so it's good for us to have a picture in front of us saying look this is you know what we got to work towards but we are all works in progress and and i'm not sharing this with you just you know uh, to say that i've attained something no uh, but more from a perspective of look this is what i'm working towards and this this helps me as a leader to make sure that i am a good leader and provide good leadership so we talked about the four C, we are talking about the four c's of leadership uh, uh that gives us a framework uh for us you know to which we can constantly keep in our minds and say you know this is what it means to be a good leader and provide good leadership so we talked about character we talked about competence we talked about compassion and under each of these we listed certain uh, key uh, aspects of that for character we mentioned seven ingredients of good character we talked about integrity accountability commitment courage diligence humility and respect under competence we said you know here are general seven general skills for competent leadership being a visionary strategizing communication people skills planning execution and learning under compassion we said here are seven expressions of compassion and leadership we talked about identifying gentleness kindness generosity forgiving sacrifice and hopefulness and all of these these three sermons are available on church website so you could go there and listen uh, read listen you know some sometimes some people come back and say you know i i hear it in ch- here in the service that i make sure i go back and i listen to it over and over again and you know i've had a lot of professionals come back and say you know this is really helping me in my professional work in what i'm doing in the workplace and that's you know that's really good to know that church is not about the sunday service it is it's about how it's impacting our everyday lives amen and it's so wonderful that you can take the truth of the scriptures and apply it into whatever you're doing and whatever occasion our profession you might be involved today we're going to talk about the final c which is charisma and by charisma we're talking about influence that we have over people the influence that you can have and really when you talk about charisma the right thing is that our character competence and compassion should give rise to our charisma it should give us the influence the access the ability to guide inspire motivate mobilize people and even to the point of influencing their choices and decisions so correctly our character competence and compassion should give us our charisma but sadly 
People gain influence and control or it, in people's lives through wrong means. You know, sometimes it's through political power, through money, uh, through other ways that they begin to exert influence on, on people's lives. And uh, that, that is not always uh, you know, positive in its uh, end results. Now, generally speaking, you know, for those of you in marketing, you will know that it, you know, to have influence on, on somebody, you need to touch them at three, three points. Right? There is the ethos, that is, you need to touch them at the level of integrity, uh, truth. Uh, there is the pathos, you need to touch them at the level of emotions. And then there is the logos, you need to touch them at the level of intellect, of logic, of reason. And if you're able to touch people in these three points, you'll actually be able to influence them. And so marketing always uses all of this. You know, in the advertising, they're actually touching to, uh, attempting to touch you at these three levels so that they can get you to buy their product or sell their service or whatever they're trying to influence us on. So in general, these three things are very important, but sometimes we see that people disregard the ethos. They don't care about the integrity, the, the truth be, behind what's being said. They may disregard the logos. They don't think about, logic, think about it logically, and they just move by the pathos, by the emotion, and then or, you, know, you can influence people uh, uh, to do sometimes crazy things just if you move them emotionally without getting them to uh, recognize the ethos and the logos. So that's just something to keep in mind. But, you know, why is charisma important? Why is it so important to have this influence? You could be a great a person with a great character and great competence and wonderful compassion. But if you don't have charisma, then you're not able to influence people. You are there. But people are not being mobilized. People aren't being influenced. And ultimately, leadership is going to, the, the, the end result of leadership is to influence people to move to something, you know, but we said to take them from where they are to where they should be. And for that, you need to be able to influence their lives. So charisma is very important. Or you could make it, uh, sum it up like in these three statements. Number one, uh, why is charisma important practically? Because we need to bring hope to those feeling hopeless in difficult situations. So you could be wonderful, you know, you have great character, competence, and compassion. And if people are going through some really difficult situation, how do you touch them so that even in the midst of their hopeless situation, they are lifted up with hope and say, yeah, you know, we can go through this. That's charisma. The ability to influence people. Are you listening? And as leaders, we need that. And, you know, I might share some examples uh, from uh, the non-biblical context. So don't think I'm a worldly preacher. Sometimes this has happened. You know, sometimes with somebody saying, this is a very worldly church. Pastor is giving worldly examples. Hey, this is, you know, it's okay. Right? So talk about Winston Churchill. Now, this is not a preacher. He was the prime minister of, uh, of, of the United Kingdom. And he became prime minister at a very difficult time. This was the time of the, world, world war, the Second World War, 1939 to 1945. And Nazi Germany under Hitler was, you know, terrorizing Europe. And the next target was the United Kingdom. And here is Winston Churchill, the leader. You know, and he is, uh, he's an outstanding leader because he led the nation through such a difficult time. And of course, a lot of other things um, happen. But, you know, listen to some of the things he said. In his very first speech as prime minister, this is what he said. This is in the May 1940. He, he stands up before um, the, the House of Commons and he says, I would say to this house, as I said to those who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many long months of toil and struggle. You ask, what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war with all our might, with all the strength that God can give us to wage war against a monstrous tyranny, never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Do you think the people were mobilized into action after this? Of course. They said, man, we got to get behind this leader. We're going to stand up for our country. 
You know, one month later, he gave another speech, and these are just excerpts from those, that's those speeches there. He says one month later, and of course, things were getting hard. France was being pushed back at this time. Um, uh, British and uh, French armies were, uh, were actually pushed back. And so uh, at this time, he stands up, and this is what he says. We shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. That's it. Now, can you imagine you listening uh, to your leader giving a speech like this and he say, yes, I am going to fight. Yeah, there's no second thought about it. So a leader is able to inspire hope in such a dark moment and say, look, we can do it, but we've got to fight. We've got to press through. Uh, you know, and a leader is able to inspire people into action. Charisma, the influence you have will move people into action and take up you know a task that might seem insurmountable you can thirdly you can mobilize people to accomplish what seems impossible you know and this again is a, is a classic example think of uh, president john f Kennedy, you know, he's, this is in September of 1962, he stands before an audience of 40,000 people at, at Rice University Stadium and he says we're going to the moon and this is what he says I'm just quoting a little, a little except there. He says, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. So they say, we're going to the moon. In seven years, they landed on the moon. Yeah. So mobilizing people into action to do something that's impossible. So that takes charisma. And of course, you have to have the first three. The character, the competence, and compassion. But then you need to be able to bring, translate that into influence uh, to move people into action, to do uh, impossible things. So in the, when you connect this to the Bible, we, in the Bible you use, we find the word honor. Honor. That God puts honor on our lives. And so from a biblical perspective, honor is very important. And so we're going to speak from that angle. You know, in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, um, uh, Solomon wrote, he said, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. You will find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Imagine being held in high esteem before God's eyes and man's eyes. Now that's honor, favor, and high esteem. But he says, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. You know, walk in mercy, walk in truth. Walk in mercy, walk in truth. Walk in mercy, walk in truth. You will have favor and high esteem before God and before men. That's what we're talking about. That people will hold you in high regard and honor and high esteem. But that comes from God. So, you know, when charisma is, uh, 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 you know, when, when it's used properly, it can build people up. And, uh, and uh, if it's used negatively, it can destroy people's lives. Now, uh, we need to, uh, distinguish charisma from good marketing and the use of media. And especially in our day, you know, you can get instant fame, you know, through media and, you know, through uh, uh, other channels that we have access to. Now, don't confuse that. Now, media does give us a lot of influence. But the thing with that is it can come, it can go away as quickly as it came. Whereas charisma is going to leave a lasting impact on people's lives. Why do we still talk about Winston Churchill? Or why do we still talk about certain leaders who have left a lasting legacy? It wasn't just the use of media. It was something more. They had strong influence and they, uh, and they did something of significance. So don't confuse the two. This honor 
There is honor that comes from God. Proverbs 22, verse 4. Let's read it out loud. I hope it comes on the screen. Let's read it out loud. Let's say this. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Let's read it one more time. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and long life. Now I'm just focusing on honor. Honor, high esteem, respect that people give you. Here it says, by humility and the fear of the Lord. It comes on our lives. So God puts honor on our lives. And uh, we've seen many examples in the Bible. I'll just point us to one example, and that is of Joshua. You know, Moses appointed Joshua as a leader, so he put some of his honor on him. But then he had a huge shoes to fill. He had to step up to this great leader. The Bible says there's never been a prophet like Moses. You know, and imagine you being the next act after Moses. Whoa, great people expect the Lord. But yet, as Joshua rose up to the occasion, what we see is God was putting honor on his life. And I'll just point us to a few verses here. In Joshua 3 verse 7, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you. In the sight of all Israel. That they may know that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Now think about God telling a man, I will exalt you. I will lift you up. I will cause you to be held in honor and high esteem. I will exalt you. And then as you trace what happens in Joshua's life, you know, after they cross the river Jordan, you read this in Joshua 4.14. It says, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. So God exalted him, and people began to respect him. The way they respected Moses. See, that is having honor come from God. That is having influence that God is putting on your life. And then after they conquered Jericho, you read this, Joshua 6, 27. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout all the country. So not only did he have honor and respect among his own people, now it spread through all the country. Other tribes and everyone else in that region began to honor, respect, hear about Joshua and say, hey, this is a great leader that's being raised up. Are you listening? So God can put honor. God can lift you up. Now, why? How is this of any relevance to you? You know, you're, you're, you may be a team leader. You've got five people under you, ten people, twenty people. You may be a project manager. You may be the head of a division, whatever. And you say, why is this important for this reason? Maybe today when you tell your people to do something, they don't do it. That's a big push. You've got to threaten them. <laughs> and only then they'll do it. But you know, when you have honor, you say something, people will go with it. Because they honor. There's something about honor on your life. And that comes from God. Now, of course, there's a wrong ways to get it. Like I mentioned, you could you know, use other means to have that kind of influence. But I'm talking about the right kind. The right kind of influence. When God puts honor on your life, People willingly follow you. They are willing to do what you say. So this charisma that we're talking about that comes from God, the honor that comes from God, is very powerful. It's very important. Because when you have charisma that's given to you by God in the eyes of people, people give you access into their lives. People are giving you their respect to the point where people are willing you willing to let you influence their choices and decisions it's an awesome place to be but it's also a very dangerous place because if you say the wrong thing they'll go and do it and it might hurt their lives so you know i i take this so seriously because when people come and sit in front of me Share their personal struggles and problems. And they say, you know, pray, tell me what is God saying? What should I do? You know, they are giving me the right of access into their lives. They are giving me the right to influence their choices and decisions. 
And if I take it lightly, if I just say, go do this, do that, and they, go do it, they will go do it. And it, if it hurts their lives, it's not good. So we must steward this charisma, this honor that God puts on our lives. Are you with me? A leader who doesn't care about the people and is only caring about his selfish interests will use his charisma for his personal gain. Not worried about what happens to them, to the people, and how they are affected. Doesn't care. As long as his own personal gain or whatever is, is met. That's misusing charisma. It's misusing this position of honor and influence you have over people's lives. So we have to be careful. So very quickly, let me mention seven building blocks of charisma. So God puts honor on our lives, but we have the responsibility of positioning ourselves to carry and grow in this charisma. And these seven building blocks are very important. I'm only going to mention them. Uh, there, there are notes in the, script, in the, in the sermon notes that you can take up our, off our website. But I want you to think about this. These seven building blocks are very important. While God puts honor on your life and God can exalt you and God can lift you up and God can give you influence and respect, you have to position yourself. You have to hold it. You're the container and these seven building blocks are so very important. Number one is your life example, how you live life day to day. When people see you as a role model, they are going to be willing to give you access into their lives. Number two, words, how you communicate. You know, and, 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 and there are all these books written about charisma and so on from different perspectives, but one of the common trends you'll find in all of these books is how you articulate your vision, how you communicate your vision, that gives you access. You know, just saying the right thing at the right time can move masses of people. So words are very important. You know, if you're a team leader, what are you speaking to your team? In hopeless situations, can you be like Winston Churchill? Imprint an image that will lift them up and say, we're going to do it. You know, or if your team is faced with uh, uh, some huge task, it seems impossible. Can you stand up there and just speak words that says, yes, we're going to go land on the moon. We're going to do it. You know, your words are so important. Thirdly, works, what you achieve are important as well. Because people look at your achievements and say, I want to follow a man who's been there, who's done that, who's accomplished it, who's, who's, you know, who's passed those hurdles that I have to go past. So your works uh, give you that, are a building block for charisma, the impact you have. How are you transforming lives? As you communicate your life lessons and experiences, do people begin to make their choices and their decisions based on your life experience? So that means your life is impacting them. And that adds to the charisma, the influence that you have on people's lives. A few more things. Investment. What are you putting into people's lives to address their long-term needs? Uh, relatability. That means do people feel connected with you? They don't need to know you personally, but can they connect with you? Can they connect with your humanity? That's very important. Under compassion, we talked about identifying people. You stepping into people's lives. Under, uh, under charisma, we're talking about you relating of people relating to you, the relatability that people have with you as a person. So uh, this is very important. Number seven, empowerment. You know, do people feel that you're moving them up in their life? Are they being empowered uh, as a leader, as a team leader? You know, does your, do, do your team members feel that you are m helping them become better at whatever they are doing? Or are you just making them work? Of course, they'll do their work in order to get their pay. But if they feel empowered, they're going to give you greater access, greater influence over their lives. Are you with me? Right? So think about these seven building blocks. I've just quickly mentioned it. But each of these are very important um, for charisma, for influence over people. So let's talk briefly now about the positive and negative use of charisma. So like we said, you know, charisma can be used either to... Do good or do harm. And I want to challenge you. In whatever place of leadership God has 
placed you, whatever level of influence God has given you, you must make the choice to use your influence for the good of people, to build them up. Never use your influence to destroy people. Don't do that. Right? So that's a deliberate choice you and I make. That we will use our influence to build people. Think about the Apostle Paul. You know, he's such a great apostle. He had so many churches, so many people. God had done some amazing things in his life. And yet, as he's dealing with the Corinthian church, uh, he has to bring correction to them. He has to deal with issues and problems that they are facing. And yet, while he is doing that, listen to what he says. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, he says, Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. Just look at that. We do all things for your edification. He's telling them, beloved, this is our motivation. We want to do it for your edification. The next chapter, 2 Corinthians 13, 13 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes to them. He says, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. So he knows, he recognizes his authority. He knows he has to you know, be firm in this particular situation. He has to use sharpness. He has to be very strict with them. And yet he says, I want to use it for your edification, not your destruction. I want to do it to build you up, not to destroy you. So we have to be very, very careful. And to use our charisma, to use it in a positive way. Don't misuse it. You know, and also in very general things, you know, uh, in our culture here, uh, we always talk about, hey, you need to have some influence. You've ever made that statement? <laughs> you need to have some influence. Oh, that means you need to know person A, B, and C sitting there on X, Y, and Z so that they can influence. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm not here to, you know, talk about that, but from a leadership perspective, when you are in a place of influence, be careful even in those matters. Don't misuse the influence you have. You know, some common things that uh, my wife and I face, and you know, Amy is, works in a hospital, and sometimes we, you know, this is very strange, and please forgive me for sharing this, but sometimes there'll be a pa call for pastor. Pastor, can you speak to your wife, Dr. Amy, and tell her to arrange a consultation with that doctor? I'm like, I'm not the hospital. <laughs> but what is it? You know, they want to use influence. See, if you want a consultation, call the hospital number. Why do you have to use influence through the past? Really? Now, if it's an emergency, of course, you know, the people, you know, there's an emergency, uh, you know, something's very, of course, we're going to do help. But to make an appointment to go see a doctor, call the hospital number. Amen, everybody? <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it gets so ridiculous like this. It's like, oh, I'm not the hospital. <laughs> but because I'm the pastor, because they come to the church, because, you know, all this. Oh. And usually I just say sorry. I say, I'll WhatsApp them. I'll, I'll, I'll WhatsApp the number to call. And I give them the hospital number. <laughs> you know, because you have influence, but don't use it like this for these kinds of things. You know, don't misuse it. It's, it's something to be valued. It's something to be treasured. You know, and the same thing about school admissions. You know, the church will give a letter and saying, you know, whatever documents you need, the church will give it. But don't say, Pastor, call the principal. Tell him, he, you know, I come to your church and you have to relax. We will not interfere with their decision-making process. They have a criteria based on which they will admit their students what we have to do is we have to follow the procedure. You submit your application, whatever letter from church, we will give it to you. But we are not going to influence that decision. Amen, everybody? You know, I mean, the point is this. Don't misuse your influence that God has given you. you know? And so, uh, you know, it's a very delicate situation. But then I usually say, you know, see, whatever help you need with the paperwork, we will do it. But we will not miss, you know, I, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. You know? And uh, we 
So you've got to steward, got to steward this. So in closing, let's talk about this. How do you maintain honor? How do you maintain this? So it's, you know, God puts honor on your life and then, you know, you may be doing the right things to, in the building blocks and you come to this place of honor and respect and uh, charisma, the influence that God has given you over people's lives, but you can destroy it in one day. You can mess it up in one day. And so what we need to do is we need to protect, we need to guard, we need to maintain this honor. And I want to leave us with these three simple things that are, are very important. Number one, you always decide to be a God pleaser. When your honor comes from God, you should live for the praises that come from God and not from man. Amen. That has to be a non-negotiable with you. Hey, this is honor that God has put on my life. So my first allegiance is to him. I have to please him. I can't be a people pleaser and expect to have honor before God and man. No. You know, Paul said this in Galatians 1.10. He said, if I still pleased men, I would not be a born servant of Christ. If I pleased men, I cannot be a servant of Christ. So very clear. My first priority is to please God. And then in the process, if I make other people happy, good. But my priority is not to please man. My priority is to please God. So that must be settled in your mind because there will always be these tensions when you want to make people happy, but you can't compromise on pleasing God. Secondly, how do you protect and maintain this honor that God puts on your life? You and I must be careful. We've got to leave self out and seek to glorify God alone. Our motive, our motivation must be, God, I want to glorify you. Whatever I'm doing, you know, we're all doing different things in life. But whatever you're doing, the motivation must be, I want to glorify God alone. I want God to be glorified. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. God, I want you to look good. I want you to be honored. I want people to magnify you. I want people to say good things about you after they see my life. I want God to be glorified. And Jesus made a powerful statement in John 7 verse 18. He said, he who speaks of himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. If you speak about yourself, you're seeking your own glory. But when you speak of the one, if you seek the glory of the one who sent you, then you are a true witness. John 7 verse 18. You know? So, whose glory are you seeking? If we are seeking our own glory, we are a false witness. But if we are seeking the glory of God, then we are a true witness. Amen? And sometimes, you know, we do ministry for our own glory. You know, I want to have a big name, a big fame, this, that. No, who cares? Because you're a false witness. So, what do you mean I'm a false witness? I'm preaching Jesus. Yeah, but you're preaching Jesus for your own sake. You're preaching Jesus for your own name, your own fame. And Jesus said, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. So we got to be very careful. Number three, how do you protect and maintain honor? You've got to judge yourself. And as leaders, this is a big problem. Because when God gives us charisma and honor and influence over people, usually, usually people under our charisma would never come and speak and tell us we are doing something wrong. Because they are under our influence. Either they respect us too much or they're just scared. But this becomes a problem in the life of the leader. Because no one is coming and telling him what you're doing is wrong. No one's telling him. Because they're under his charisma, they're under his influence. But this is the very cause of the downfall of many leaders. Because of the charisma, nobody is willing to tell them. So the solution is, or at least part of the solution is, we must judge ourselves. And Paul the Apostle, and I'll just quote two of his uh, two of the references. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.27. He says, I discipline my body and bring it 
into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul is very conscious of it. He says, look, I have to watch over my own life because after I've preached to all these people, if I go off track, I disqualify myself. Another place in 1 Corinthians 11.31, he says, If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If you don't want the judgment of God, hey, you judge yourself. If we judge ourselves, we protect ourselves from the judgment of God. Because even before God could get to you, you say, God, deal with me. So you judge your own self. Are you listening? So that's something as leaders... We've got to develop the ability to judge yourself. Be strict with yourself. Now, here's something I do personally. I tell myself that I always have to hold myself to a higher standard than the people I lead. If I expect a 5 from you, I expect a 10 from me. I always have to hold myself to a higher standard than the people I lead. And that's the only way, as a leader, you can protect the honor that God puts on your life. You've got to judge yourself. And this takes a lot of wisdom. You know, when David was being celebrated as the national hero, people were singing his praises. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain ten thousands. After he killed Goliath, you repeatedly see in First Samuel chapter 18, you see that what did David do? While people were celebrating him, it says he behaved himself wisely. It's very, very poignant scripture. He behaved himself wisely. People celebrating. Oh, David is such a great man. But he walked even more carefully with wisdom. So he was not treating that very lightly. So motive is the main issue here. If we can guard our motive, we can make sure we steward the charisma, the honor, the influence that God gives to us. So worship team, please come. So this brings us to the end of this sermon series character on, on, on leadership. The four C's of leadership. Character, competence, compassion, and charisma. Now the, the media team has put this into a nice graphic. We'll put it up on our website and make it available so you can download it and stick it on your desktop computer or on your desktop or whatever you want just to keep reminding yourself the four C's of charisma and the seven aspects that go under each of those. Um, think about it. Reflect on it. And see if you can grow in these areas in your life as a leader, in your character, in our character, in our competence, in our compassion, and in our charisma. And as, as leaders, if we can grow in these things. We can be good leaders, providing good leadership. Amen? Let's rise to your feet, please. And we're going to take a few moments just to worship pray and we'll dismiss we're going to do a two-part series starting next sunday on healing after abuse or trauma we we are very aware that you know people have gone through abuse gone through trauma how do we receive healing for that so we'll do that on the 14th and then on the 28th in the middle we have a guest speaker dr pg Vergis will be ministering here uh, on 21st so he'll be ministering so we have a little break uh, but on the 14th and 28th we will be talking about healing after abuse or trauma invite some friends you know who maybe would have gone through this in their lives and you know just just invite them let's see what the Lord will do in their lives just as they hear the word of God and they're in the presence of God maybe God would touch them God would heal them God would restore them give them hope so think about it. Invite somebody who might benefit from listening to those two sermons. And August 21st, Dr. P.G. Verghese will be here, a wonderful man of God. And 
God has used him powerfully in missions based in Delhi but he'll be ministering here on the 21st before we close let's take some time to pray please and just pray over your own life and say God help me to be a good leader to get better as a leader whatever God has given you whatever influence whatever place of leadership it's a gift that God has given you he has designed you for that he has helped build your character he's helped develop your competence he has nurtured your compassion and today we learned that he's calling us to steward the charisma the influence he's given let's be good stewards of it let's use it for good for the glory of god and the good of people could you take some time to pray Father, we just pray the empowering of your Holy Spirit on every person here, God, every person that you have raised up to be a leader. We pray also for those watching online, God, that you've, you've placed people in leadership. And we pray that you'll help us become better leaders and provide better leadership for the people entrusted to our care. Father, that through our lives and through the influence you've given us, God will be glorified. Jesus will be exalted. And people's lives will be bettered, oh God. They will be in a better place. Because you set us among them to serve them. They will be helped, nurtured, and brought to higher levels. Father, we pray over people here that you will increase and extend their influence. Just as we read about Joshua, God, you magnified him among his people. Then you extended that throughout the country. We pray over people today in this auditorium, those watching online. God Almighty, that you will extend their influence beyond their current borders. That you, God, because you choose to do it, will exalt them. Will put them in places of honor, leadership and influence. In our nation, across the land and beyond, oh God. Because you choose to do it and they stand before you. Humbly and in the fear of God. God be read in your word through humility and the fear of the Lord our riches, honor and long life God do this for your people Father raise up people who will have influence over our nation for good in a positive way raise up people who will have influence in various spheres of activity God where there is darkness, let them come like a shining light because of the influence you give them, because of the honor you put on their life, because you choose to exalt them, Lord. God, if you took David and made him king, you can take anyone here and give them influence because you choose to. Anyone. And those watching online, we pray over them. As well may there be people here God who have influence in the arena of sports government technology and 
in every sphere, every sphere. May they be a shining light. May they have influence for good. So that darkness will have to retreat and corruption and violence and injustice will have to retreat because here come anointed men and women raised up by God to be leaders to bring righteousness and justice and to advance the kingdom of God among men. Release such grace, release such anointing upon your people. Put, Lord, that, that, that anointing on people, the empowering from heaven to do this, Lord. May this seed happen in their lives. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I just want you to get ready because I'm not just saying these nice words, but I believe God is doing this for people. I believe it. I believe God wants to do it. He wants to do it in your life. Believe it. Don't look at yourself. Look at God. Look at what God can do. How big He is. How powerful He is. How awesome He is. Believe it. Believe it. Thank you, God. Thank you. And may there be many who say thank you to Jesus. Because you raised up such people to make a difference, Lord. Thank you. We praise you. We honor you. Thank you. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God. God be the glory for the things He has done and what He will do. To God be the glory. Amen. Before we close, we want to give an invitation to anybody. You've never received Jesus Christ into your life. You have come here, heard the message, enjoyed the worship and the prayer and but something in your heart says, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. That's happening because you're in the presence of God. God is moving on your heart and saying, you need Him in your life. And the God we serve is the God who turns our ashes into beauty. 
he turns all our mess around and he gives us hope he gives us a future but you need to let him come in to your life and Jesus Christ comes in he forgives our sins he takes us out of darkness into his marvelous light and he makes us sons and daughters of God only Jesus can do that and if you feel in your heart you want to receive Jesus I want to give you this opportunity to do that this morning. I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer and if you've never prayed this prayer in your life before, I want to invite you to do it today. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God and help me to follow you and you alone. for the rest of my life. And I pray this Lord in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Anyone here you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? The first time in your life you prayed this prayer with me. We want to see your hand. We want to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, could you raise your hand? Anyone in this auditorium? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life. Just raise your hand. Anyone? Anyone else? Anyone? Is there somebody I see one hand there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Our greeters will come to you and give you a welcome back. I see another one, another hand there right there. God bless you. God bless right there. Just raise your hand and make sure our greeters come to you. Anybody else? Anybody else? It's wonderful. We celebrate with you. Our greeters will give you a welcome a, a bag which has some resources there's also a card that says decision card kindly write your name and number and hand it back to them and we we will get in touch with you from the church office uh, and just give you some guidance on what to do next all right we're going to close we'll dismiss if you need prayer our pastors will be here to pray with you and uh, minister to you let's close please father we thank you for this morning and we just declare the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our heavenly father and the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit be upon each one always in jesus name amen amen thank you for listening we trust this message was a blessing to you for more free resources including sermons sermon notes and books please visit apcw.org For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.